from Hollywood. It's time now for Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. This is Mrs. Wish, Mr. Dollar. Oh, yes? Uh, do I understand that you're in San Francisco because of the disappearance of my husband? That's right, Mrs. Wish. The doctor's insurance company seem to feel that the circumstances deserve some looking into. It is very strange, and I'm quite frightened. I know you must be upset, and I know that the police have bothered you quite a bit. But I wonder if I could come out and talk to you. Of course, Mr. Dollar. Only one thing is important. That is to learn that my husband is alive and safe. Please feel free to come any time that's convenient to you. Edmund O'Brien in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Washingtonian Life Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Malcolm Wish MD matter. Expense account item one, $218.45, airfare and incidentals between Hartford and San Francisco. There, after a phone call to his wife, I went to the home of the missing Dr. Wish, which was situated about halfway up fashionable Knob Hill. Oh, Mrs. Wish is expecting me. My name is Dollar. Yes, she is. Come in. Thank you. You're the insurance investigator. That's right. I'm the daughter. My name's Cecil. You learned anything about father? Not yet, but I just got here this morning. Gee, I should have realized that. I, I'd like to talk to you about it. You mean you think you know some other things that other people don't? Some other people. You haven't told the police? No, I didn't like the man who came here. Lieutenant Hughes. I don't want to talk to you until after you've seen her. Sure, anything you say. Where are you staying? The Cleveland Hotel on Sutter. I'm going to be downtown. I'll meet you at the coffee shop at noon. Okay, Cecil, I'll be there. Now, where can I find your mother? The second door leads to the morning room in the view of the bay. She's waiting, so just walk right in. And don't mention what I said to you. All right. I'll see you later. Yeah. Mrs. Wish? Yes? I was told to come right in. I'm Johnny Dollar. Oh, yes, I've been waiting. Uh, come and sit down. I'll take up as little of your time as possible, Mrs. Wish. Oh, it's quite all right. I understand the last time you saw your husband was night before last when he left the house to make a professional call. That's correct. Would you tell me about it, please? Oh, I only wish I knew more about it. Uh, my husband very seldom accepts night calls. But night before last, the phone rang and he talked for a moment. And then he left. What time is that? A little past nine. Isn't it his habit to let you know where he's going when he goes out at night? No, I'm afraid it isn't anymore. Once it was, yes. And you didn't hear him mention the name of the patient that called him? No. I was out of the room and he answered the phone himself. Well, he must have said something to you. Well, he seemed to be in a hurry. And he told me he'd be back in an hour or so that it was an emergency. Naturally, we assumed that it was one of his regular patients. So yesterday, my daughter and I started phoning them. We got the names from Dr. Huber. He's the other doctor in your husband's office? Yes. I believe he's called some of Malcolm's patients, too, but... None of them seem to have phoned that night. Oh, I'm terribly worried, Mr. Dollar. We'll do everything we can. How do I get to his office from here, Mrs. Wish? It's in the Tide Building on post. You can take the cable car on the corner. It'll drop you just a half a block away. Thanks. I'll be in touch with you. Come right in, Mr. Dollar. I'm sorry I was so brief with you on the phone. I had a patient in the office at the time. That's perfectly all right, Dr. Huber. It wouldn't help matters to discuss Malcolm's disappearance in front of him. You know how tongues wag. Uh, please be seated. It is true that this situation is not yet common knowledge? The papers have left it alone. How did you hide the truth when you phoned his patient? What? Oh, of course you have met with his wife. She was insistent that I do that. But it is not my duty, I thought, at least at this time. Do you not agree? I suppose so, if you don't think Dr. Wish is in danger. I don't jump to that conclusion until I see some reason. The man has disappeared, Doctor. Many men have disappeared. Dr. Wish is 52 years old. He has practiced here in San Francisco for more than 20 years, before that in Seattle. The past two months, I have noticed a change in him. Uh, tiring. He 
was no longer satisfied with his life. Are you inferring that he might have ducked out on his own? Perhaps even amnesia. Does it sound like amnesia for a man to answer the phone, tell his wife he'll be home in a short time, pick up his medical kit and drive away in his car? Who knows about amnesia? Does an amnesia victim go to the trouble of keeping a car hidden from the police of three states? It would depend on the type of amnesia. I didn't think there were types, so you must mean voluntary or involuntary. If he did just suddenly drop his life here, and you know that to be the case, I, I hope know you... I know nothing. Dr. Wish and I discuss very little but medical matters. I repeat that I realize that for two months or longer he was not a happy man. If he has made arrangements to change that, I do not know, but it is a possibility. You wouldn't tell me if he were in trouble over his practice, would you? I would not, but I'm sure that he was. Dr. Wish is, to the best of my knowledge, a highly ethical man of medicine. You're probably being cooperative, Doctor, but I'm not sure whether it's with Wish or with the police and me. I am simply without information. Yeah. Uh, I have an appointment in 15 minutes, but I'd like to come back this afternoon and get a list of his patients. You are welcome. Uh, please mention it to the receptionist on the way out. She'll be happy to gather the information for you. <laughs> Would you prefer a table or the counter? I uh, was supposed to meet someone here at noon. Five after, sir. Yeah, I know. Well, I don't see her. I guess she's later than I am. Would it have been a Miss Cecil wish, sir? Oh, yes, that's right. Then if you're Mr. Dollar, she phoned and asked me to tell you that she wasn't able to lunch with you, but that she would be reached by phone at her home any time after two. I see. Oh, well, thanks very much. I'll take the counter. Might as well have a sandwich. <laughs> I didn't suspect Cecil's motives until I left the coffee shop. Then I realized I was being followed. I kept my eyes pretty much off the man, but saw enough to describe him. Medium height and a broad-shouldered suit, and the hair that showed below a hat was so white blonde that I thought it must have been bleached. He followed me to a drugstore where I phoned Lieutenant Hughes, the detective on the case. Then my shadow followed me aboard a Market Street bus and dropped off a block after I did. He was lounging on a corner when I went into police headquarters. Glad to have you in town, Dollar. But I don't have anything to give you. I put out a description of the doctor in his car, and I've been riding along on that. I'll have to for a few more days unless something breaks. I take it you've talked to the other doctor in his office? Yeah, I talked to him. And he hinted that Dr. Wish dropped out of sight. Yeah, and that in itself doesn't happen to be a crime. No, not yet, anyway. Things like that sometimes crowd the law against insurance fraud, Lieutenant. Well, not for a while. Oh, don't think I'm passing this off without reason. But the information I have now, there's darn little I can do. Except wait and see if the wife doesn't get a brush off by mail from Alaska or someplace that's legal. You have a line on any women in his life? It doesn't necessarily have to be one, does it? It helps sometimes. Do you know any reason why somebody should be tailing me? Tailing you? When'd you spot it? Right after I had lunch at the Cleveland Hotel coffee shop. When do you think the table was put on you? I'm not sure. I went out to the wish house this morning. From there, I went to his office. From there, to the coffee shop. And I came here. Hmm. Any ideas? Yeah. I've got an idea that a man who wants to drop out of sight wouldn't risk drawing attention to himself by putting a tail on somebody who's looking for him. Did you? <laughs> Hardly. It's all right with you. I'd like to leave things the way they are. I wanted to let you know about it, but I think we ought to let him play for a while. I'll go along with it. I got some good men I could put on it, but... Uh... There's always a chance of tipping him. Let's leave him alone. Maybe he's only a hungry tourist who thinks I might lead him to a good steak. He followed me back to the doctor's office, and he was waiting for me 50 minutes later when I left with the names, addresses, and phone numbers of what I'd been told were all the patients of Dr. Wish. By this time, I was learning a few things about the man following me. He was good at it. Unobtrusive, not too eager yet never losing me, though I didn't make myself too easy to follow. I let my shadow watch me buy some stationery and a paper near my hotel. Then I went up to my room, hoping he'd relax downstairs. I checked in the corridor three times in the next half hour, and then at 2.15, I phoned the wish house. Hello? 
Miss Wish? Yes, who's this? It's the dollar. Oh, I'm sorry about not meeting you. Something came up that I couldn't get out of. You may have more trouble getting out than even you figured on. What'd you say? It doesn't look good when you promise information and then don't show up to give it. Why did you really make that date and then not show up? I couldn't help it. There wasn't anything I could do about it. What is this information you have? You can give it to me now, can't you? Not over the phone. I'll come up there. No, because Mother will be here. I'll have to meet you someplace. Are you at your hotel? I can be any time you say. Where then, the bar? I think it would better be my room. Well, that... All right. I'll be there at 8.30. Which one is it? 8.30? Why so late? Because Mother will be here and I'll have to sneak out. Sounds as if you've learned something, have you? We'll talk about it when you get here. The room is 323. Don't stop at the desk. Come right up to the third floor and wait near the elevators. I'll be a minute or so late. But why do I have to Never wait? mind. Be here. If you stand me up again, I'll see that the police make the next date with you. Why are you threatening me? I'll be there. So will I, Cecil. Goodbye. I left as soon as I'd hung up and led my shadow away from the hotel before I thought there could have been any contact between him and Cecil Wish. I kept him moving the rest of the afternoon and away from phones as much as possible while I called on some of the missing doctor's patients. I arranged it so that he couldn't have seen her go into the hotel. And still, when I reached the third floor, she wasn't waiting for me. When I spotted Lieutenant Hughes leaning against my door, I thought I knew why. Where the devil have you been, Dolly? But we lost I've been you. trying to do my job. Did you scare a girl away from here? Or did you notice? There's a time and place. Tell me, does this man stop tailing you? No, he's waiting across the street from the entrance. Why, Lieutenant? Dr. Wisher's coat, hat, shoes, and the suicide note were found on the Golden Gate Bridge about an hour ago. Uh-oh. Have they found his body? Not yet. And now explain for what possible reason this guy should have been tailing you. <laughs> Turn you to the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in just a moment. George Raft, popular screen star, plays Rocky Jordan, an American in Cairo. His mission, adventure. Every week, starting next Wednesday, over most of these same CBS stations, George Raft as Rocky Jordan gets enmeshed in new, often bizarre exploits. Next Wednesday, Rocky Jordan takes part in a search to find a beach strewn with diamonds. Don't miss this exciting CBS thriller. Now with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we return you to the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. As it turned out, the lieutenant and I, instead of playing it smart, should have collared the blonde shadow hours before, but the boat had sailed. By the time we got down to the street, he disappeared. An alarm was broadcast on his description, and Lieutenant Hughes and I went up to the wish address. This doesn't seem possible. I feel myself to accept almost any kind of horrible news, an accident, some sudden illness, anything but not this. Didn't your husband in any way show that he might have been despondent? In no way. Was there any trouble between you and him? We were normally happy little bats. Cecil. Yes, Mother? Was there anything hidden from me? Was your father unhappy because of something that you knew about and I didn't? Not that I know of, Mother. You've seen the note, Mrs. Wish? Yes, I've seen the note. And you're still sure he wrote it? Oh, I wish I weren't so sure. I'm sorry that it has to be brought up, but it sounded as if he were pretty unhappy about his life. Whatever it was, he kept it hidden. I hadn't an inkling. We've been so happy. The other doctor in his office thought that he might not have been so happy. Then Dr. Huber was aware of something I knew nothing about. Perhaps I was blind. Oh, oh I just... I'm, I'm awfully sorry. Now we're going to have to talk about it. Oh, I just... She's doing quite well, don't you think? Uh, just... Not as well as you are. I'm not trying. I... What are you doing? Being honest. Father's not dead, and I think she knows it. I'm mm, glad you're so sure. It's not a suicide from the Golden Gate Bridge. That's too much. Come on out in the other room. I'm going to get myself. We'll be back in a minute, Lieutenant. Uh, yeah, all right. Cecil, where are you going? I'll come right back, Mother. Father had no reason to take his life. What do you think has happened, then? I was going to tell you what I thought when we planned to meet at noon. But he changed my mind. Is there a change of mind what came up that you couldn't get out of? Harder to get away from than a lot of things. 
First, I thought that he was playing a dirty trick on me. Then I wondered if I wouldn't be playing a dirtier one on him by telling you about it. You changed your mind about meeting me at 7, too. I got the news about the things on the bridge just as I was leaving. Father's reached what they call the dangerous age. I guess it is. Finally fell in love. I don't envy him. Dr. Huber diagnosed it as possible amnesia. A typical Huber diagnosis. I don't think he knows about things. But you found out. Of course I did. I wasn't taken in by these night calls at all. I followed him. I even talked to her without her knowing who I was. It was nice. And I felt like a chaperone. What's her name? Ann Movies. Did she talk you into luring me to that coffee shop? What do you mean? I was onto that guy that was following me from the time I left there. I don't know what you mean. Stop it. I led him right over to police headquarters and told Lieutenant Hughes about him. Mr. Dollar, I don't know what you're talking about. The guy was good. I had half a hunch he might be a private detective. But then when I realized how well practiced he was on melting away from the police, I began to wonder. There's a police alarm out on him now, so you'll save a lot of time and trouble by telling me who he is and where we can find him. You think I made you go there so you could be followed? I was followed. Why? You put me in that coffee but shop. why were you followed? Because I was looking for your father. You know that. I don't know what it is. I don't know anything about her. She's younger than father, about 34 or 5. Married or single? I don't know. Where does she live? Wesley. It's an apartment of building on Dan Air. I thought they'd run away together. Maybe. Give me the apartment number. Lieutenant and I will go and see. <laughs> Carson City, Nevada. Yeah. Let's look in there. Got the light switch? Uh, yeah. Hmm. There's the shirt that was under the coat. Oh, look there, more blood stains on the bed. There's something more, Lieutenant. It figures that Dr. Wish was here, all right. There was a metal wastebasket in the bathroom doorway. In it was a large amount of surgical dressing, all bloodstained. It told of a wound that had been dressed and redressed a number of times. Other things in the room fell into place. A sales slip from Mills Department Store in San Francisco. It was in receipt of the purchase of a man's shirt and jacket, probably to replace the bloodstained ones left in the apartment. The slip was dated PM, the current day, which was Thursday. And finally, on the dresser, we found a day-old Nevada newspaper. The front page item that seemed to fit reported unidentified trio murders and robs Carson City bet maker. Dying man believed to have wounded one of his assailants. Well, the time figure's all right. Leaving then, they could have gotten to San Francisco by eight or so. The night the doctor disappeared. There are a couple of stands in town that carry out a state paper. They're a day old, so this one must have been bought today. And we didn't miss him by far, Lieutenant. According to the signs, this guy must be in pretty bad shape. To get him out of this building without drawing attention, they'd have to do it after dark, don't you think? Yeah, I think they were plenty rushed. They'd have done something to cover up the tracks here if they'd had time. Doctor Wish's coat and stuff on the Golden Gate Bridge, where does that lead? Almost any place. It's wide open once you're across the bridge. But the blonde man who was still following me when I met you at the hotel, after sticking together this far, would they leave him or come back after him? That's a thought. I'm going to get on the phone out here and put some men on him. I'll check the tenants on this floor and see if the building manager's come in yet. I'll meet you at your office. I got nothing from the building. The woman, Ann Movius, hadn't lived there long enough to become friendly with anyone. The manager knew that she had received men visitors now and then, but that was all. Nobody had seen an injured man enter or leave. An hour later in Lieutenant Hughes's office, I learned that the police had had better luck than I had. I got on the teletype to Carson City. 
Your description of the blonde man fits with the hair of a man named Ned Ring. Records in Nevada and Utah. Anybody with hair like that never should have tried to be a criminal. Yeah. And I gave him the name Movius. They have an Alan Movius. No record. But I know an associate of this Ned Ring. So it figures. No next of kin on Movius, I suppose, huh? No. But he must be a brother to the woman. Unless that's her married name. Anyway, they never heard of her. She's clean as far as we're concerned. Hmm. Yeah. Well, I guess she just happened to know her. Wait a minute. Hello. Right. Well, that's the name, all right. Oh, good. Put him in a room. We'll be right down. How was that? Your blonde friend. He was picked up boarding an airport limousine. Well, Ring, I'm glad to see you. Look, I don't know what any of this is all about. You got no right to hold me. What happened, Ring? Did your buddies duck out on you? What do you mean, my buddies duck out on me? Where were you flying to when you got picked up? The other cop got my ticket. It says L.A. I got a right to go to L.A., haven't I? Is that where your buddies are going? What buddies? I was going along. Why weren't you going to Carson City? Look, what's eating you two? You must have me mixed up with somebody else. Your name is Ned Ring, isn't it? Yeah, sure it is. How do you think we found out what your name was? Well, he had it all over me. The other cop got my wallet and stuff. We had your name before you were picked up. We got it from Carson City. What do you give me this stuff for? Maybe he doesn't oh, know. the devil he doesn't. You don't think you followed me all day without my catching on to it, do you? Never saw you before. How about a Dr. Malcolm Wish? Or Ann Mulvey? I'm not talking to you guys. A couple of men are on their way from Carson City. Maybe you'd rather wait and talk to them. I don't know anything about anybody in Carson City. Yes, you do, Ring. It started out to be an unidentified trio that killed that pet maker in Carson City. But it isn't anymore. We've got your name and we've got another one, Alan Movius. And we've got a link between Ann Movius and the doctor that disappeared the other night. He was held in an apartment on Van Ness. He took care of one of your buddies who'd been shot. That's a kidnapping, right? And now it looks like another murder. You tried to set it up like a suicide, but if he went off that bridge, he was pushed. I don't know anything about that. About what? That, that, whatever you're talking about. Get off it, Ring. You're tied up. They left your Ring, didn't they? They had to get out of that apartment. And while they had you off tailing me around town, they left. And they left a hundred leads pointing right at you. That's why you're here. They even left the newspaper with the story of that Carson City killing. They really ratted out on you. Yeah. Yeah, they sure did, didn't they? All right, where'd they go? I don't know. They did. Don't think I wouldn't tell you. They pulled out before you saw me go into my hotel about 8.30. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it was it. Who's the one who was wounded? Mobius. We couldn't just leave him in Nevada. We should have. Kept yelling about a sister and Frisco was friends with a doctor, so we... Drove them all the way here. How bad is Movius? Pretty bad. Slug is inside him someplace. How far do you think they could drive on him? <laughs> I didn't think he could be moved out of that apartment without killing him. Where does the sister stand in all this? No place. She was stuck. Seeing her brother like that, she couldn't think of anything but him. She lied to the doc. She told him she got hurt to get him over. Then Gould and me woke up. Gould? He's the third man? Yeah, yeah. He's the one who did the gun work in Carson City. We knew we couldn't let the doc go unless Movius died or else got better so we'd get out of here. We was trapped more than the doc was. That's why I had a plan on his house and pick you up. I think you're talking straight with us, Ring. I hope you are. I haven't got much reason not to, have I? Well, there must have been some talk about where you'd go if you had to leave. We never did get to that. I knew where they were, brother, I tell you. And you can believe that. I'm not aching to take all this by myself. <laughs> able and willing to supply some more pertinent information, such as a description of the other man, Gould, and the make, model, and license number of the car they were driving. Even with that, it looked like the case would stretch over into the next day. But at 11.30, Lieutenant Hughes got a phone call from Petaluma, a small town some 30 miles north of San Francisco. In all that drugstore, the druggist was handed a prescription for a painkiller that he had his doubts about. It was filled out by a Dr. A. Wish. He called the sheriff's office, and they have a man on the customer. Yeah, this is probably it. <laughs> Sheriff Hill was right behind us. You get the layout of this place? I guess all these motels are about the same. Driveway up the middle. Rooms on each side. Uh, that puts the number 12 on this side, I guess. Right. I 
wondered if it was the one with the light showing under the curtain. I put two men to watch this side, but I don't think there's a way out except the driveway. All right, Sheriff. Well, I think we're ready to go in. Number 12 was in the middle of the row of accommodations on the right. Only three of us went to the door, and none of us expected trouble. Certainly none of us expected the kind of trouble we found. Yes? Police. Where's Dr. Wish? Police? I am Dr. Wish. I'll stay outside, Lieutenant. No, that's sir. You all right, Dr. Wish? Yes. I was sort of surprised when you answered the door. Where are the others? Ann Mobius, her brother, the man named Gould. They... They are here. Where? In the bedroom. I'd like to tell you I... I've killed them all. Sit down, Dr. Wish. I'm going to go take a look, darling. Tell me what happened. I killed them. When we left the city, I knew I would. I... I'd have to or die myself. I told Gould only one thing would save Movius and wrote the prescription, and I killed him with it. The wounded man with an injection, the others internally in water. And Movius, too? Yeah, and Movius, too. With her brother. She was with him. She told me she wasn't. She told me she... I... I didn't believe. I didn't believe. <coughs> Dr. Wish. She told me before she died. She... <coughs> Lieutenant Hughes. No. We have to get him to a doctor. He's got some of that stuff himself. Expense account item two, miscellaneous, $140.50. Item three, same as item one, transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $577.40. Remarks, we got Dr. Wish to a doctor in time to save his life. So your policyholder, although alive, is also a triple murderer. He claims it was justifiable, but at the same time, it was premeditated, so there's a fine line to draw. What I keep remembering is that his daughter, Cecil said he had reached the dangerous age. And I guess he had. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and is written by Gil Dowd. Edmund O'Brien can soon be seen in the Paramount Pictures production, Warpath. Featured in tonight's cast were Jeanette Nolan, Virginia Gregg, Ray Hartman, Bill Boucher, Tony Barrett, and Lou Krugman. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, was transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. This is Dan Coverly inviting you to join us next week at the same time when Edmund O'Brien returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. For your security, for your country's security, invest regularly in United States defense bonds. Buy them automatically through the payroll savings plan where you work. For personal security, for America's defense. Now, let's all buy bonds. Elation and syncopation are the main elements of tonight's Bing Crosby show over most of these same CBS stations. No wonder. The groaner himself vocalizes and informalizes. And Bing's guests include Tommy Dorsey with some fancy licks on his slide trombone, hot violinist Joe Venuti, and that equally torrid songbird, Teresa Brewer. Tonight on the Bing Crosby show, for it follows immediately over most of these same CBS stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.